My name is Varun Soni. I'm the Dean of Religious Life here at USC. I'm so grateful to all of you for coming out this evening for our very special event uh, featuring Dr. James Doty. Before we begin, uh, I would be remiss if I did not mention um, that this has been a sad week for us at USC. As many of you know, our former provost, Elizabeth Garrett, passed away yesterday at the age of 52 from colon cancer. In addition to being the first woman provost of USC, she was also the first woman president of Cornell University, where she served for eight months. You know, her tragic passing has left many of us feeling um, filled with shock and sadness, but uh, I know her legacy and her memory lives on at USC, and also right here uh, this evening at this event, which is sponsored by Mindful USC, a university-wide initiative that she helped promote, uh, sponsor, and cultivate. So we'll all be thinking of her this evening. Mindful USC is a new university-wide initiative. It's focused on making mindfulness practices part of the culture of the Trojan family. Over the last three semesters, we have offered free mindfulness courses for USC faculty, staff, and students. And this semester alone, more than 500 people will go through our five-week program. We just opened up new classes for the second part of this semester. So if you go to mindful.usc.edu, you can sign up for a free five-week class, uh, either on mindful introduction to mindfulness, mindfulness-based st um, stress reduction. We have a class on mindful writing. Um, so there's a whole um, a bunch of options. But I suggest you check out mindful.usc.edu. And many thanks to the Mindful USC team for sponsoring this event this evening. This evening, we are so fortunate to be able to host a book talk featuring Dr. James Doty and his extraordinary new book, Into the Magic Shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. Since I've been at USC, I've hosted a number of conversations and programs focused on the convergence of spirituality and science. Oftentimes, however, especially on university campuses, the dialectic between spirituality and science is presented as a false binary, in my opinion, between faith and reason. But in fact, the relationship is much more nuanced, sophisticated, and interesting than that. And more than any other book that I've read, Into the Magic Shop, with its focus on the brain and on the heart, offers us a signpost to a new way of thinking about the interplay of science and spirituality. And I'm so grateful to uh, James for flying in from Northern California to be with us this evening for this event and really help us think deeply about this relationship between spiritual, spirituality and science. I'm not the only one who loves his book. Uh, his Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet, also loves this book and wrote, this book tells a remarkable story of a neurosurgeon's quest to unravel the mystery of the link between our brains and our hearts. From the moment in his childhood when a simple act of kindness changed the course of his own life to his founding a center to study compassion at Stanford University, Jim Doty's life illustrates how each of us can make a difference. We can make the world a more compassionate place. I'm sure many readers will be moved by this inspiring story to open their hearts and see what they can do for others. I don't know if any of us will ever get a book endorsement like that, uh, especially from someone like the Dalai Lama. It's pretty extraordinary. Um, so I am very grateful to welcome my friend uh, James Doty, a globally renowned neurosurgeon, back to campus for this special event. He is a clinical professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford University, but we'll forgive him for his university affiliation. Uh, he is also the director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford University School of Medicine, or CARE. As director of CARE, uh, Jim has collaborated on a number of research projects focused on compassion and altruism, including the use of neuroeconomic models to assess altruism, the use of CARE developed compassion cultivation training in individuals and its effect, assessment of compassionate and altruistic judgment utilizing implanted brain electrodes, and the use of optogenetic techniques to assess nurturing pathways in rodents. Presently, he is developing collaborative research pro projects to assess the effect of compassion training on uh, immunologic and other physiologic determinants of health, the use of mentoring as a method of instilling compassions in, compassion in students, and the use of compassion training to decrease pain. Dr. Do Doty is also an inventor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. He has given support to a number of charitable organizations supporting a variety of programs throughout the world, including those for HIV AIDS support, blood banks, medical care in third world countries, and peace initiatives. Additionally, he has endowed chairs at major universities, including Stanford University and his all Tulane. He's on the board of directors of a number of nonprofit foundations, <clears throat> including the Dalai Lama Foundation, of which he is chairman and the Charter for Compassion Inter uh, International, the Charter for Compassion International, of which he is vice chair. 
He is also on the International Advisory Board of the Council for the Parliament of the World's Religions. I'll always be indebted to him for bringing my spiritual hero, the Dalai Lama, to USC in 2011. This evening for, uh, evening format will be as follows. First, uh, James will read a, a passage from his book. Then I will spend a little bit of time just interviewing him about his book. And then we'll open it up for a larger conversation with all of you. After the event, we'll be hosting a book signing and sale outside. So the bookstore is here. Please purchase one or several books. Uh, Jim will stick around to sign and memorialize those books for you. Um, like I said, it's an extraordinary book, uh, and uh, it's a really great opportunity for us to meet the author and learn more about the book. Uh, we also have punch and cookies outside, so please stick around for the reception. So all that being said, please join me in giving a warm Trojan welcome to Dr. James Doty. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for coming this evening. You know, I left San Francisco, it was about 50 degrees, and it was raining, so I said, well, it's probably going to be that way down here, and I get down here, and it's like sunny, and uh, I'm like, my God, it's hot down here. Um, so let me give you, before I start reading from this book, let me give you a little background that sets the stage for what I'm going to read. So what this book is, is a, has anybody read the book? Do you like it? I'll give you your $50. Uh, this is part neuroscience, it's part memoir, it's part contemplative practice. And really it's a narrative of my own life and how the trajectory of my life changed by meeting an incredible woman when I was 12. And my backstory uh, was that my father was an alcoholic, my mother was an invalid, she had had a stroke, was partially paralyzed chronically depressed, had attempted suicide multiple times. We were on public assistance. Neither of uh, uh, my parents had gone to college. So this is not necessarily the best uh, background for which one to s is to succeed in life, probably, because there are so many barriers against uh, an individual overcoming that type of a background. But what happened to me was at 12, I walked into a magic shop, and the owner wasn't there, but his mother was there. And, uh, and we'll probably talk about this in a few minutes, but that singular interaction with this woman over a six week period during the summer changed the trajectory of my life. And I tell people it was my first experience with this concept of neuroplasticity, which wasn't even a term that was utilized in 1968. And <clears throat> over that six week period, she essentially rewired my brain. So at the end of the period, of time with this woman, although my personal circumstance did not fundamentally change, how I perceived myself and how I responded changed. And what that response caused was that the world responded differently to me. And it allowed me to have great success by most measures of uh, success. Uh, it allowed me to become a physician, uh, a professor of neurosurgery at Stanford, an entrepreneur who was CEO of a company that went public for $1.3 billion. It allowed me to be an entrepreneur. It allowed me to lose all the money I made, which is another story. But the most important thing it allowed me to do was to connect with my heart and understand the importance of connecting with your heart and having an open heart and recognizing that all individuals are suffering and uh, responding to that suffering and that changed everything and that has allowed me to have some of the most deep uh, experiences I've ever had as a human being including uh, what uh, uh, Varun referred to uh, in terms of my relationship with the Dalai Lama as well as other spiritual leaders. So <clears throat> with that as the backstory I'd like to just read a little bit of the book if that's okay with you. Now, you know, I usually have a book of my own, which I forgot, so now I have to actually find the spot in my book here that I was going to read to you. And this chapter is called Growing Pains. I left earlier than usual for the magic shop because it was expected to be one of the hottest August days on record in Lancaster, triple digits. The sky was full of wispy clouds that looked more sooty than white. 
It wasn't sunny and it wasn't cloudy and everywhere you looked was either brown or gray. I could feel the heat coming up from the ground through the pedals on my bike. So hot I thought it would singe the hair on my legs. I had to alternate one hand at a time on the handlebars so both hands didn't feel like they were burning. I tried riding no-handed for a while down Avenue K and was just getting up a good rhythm when I heard yelling from the field next to the Episcopal Church. I recognized the bigger kid, the one who was throwing the punches. He was two grades above me, and both my brother and I had been punched around, hit a few times, and even spat on by him and his trusty sidekick. They were a gang of two and pretty much ruled Lancaster in the afternoon between the hours of three and five during the school year. Obviously, they were operating on extended summer hours because here it was not even 10 a.m., and I could see one of them punching and kicking a kid while the other yelled and laughed. I couldn't see who it was because the kid on the ground was curled up and his head was down. His arms were wrapped around the top of his head trying to protect it. For a second, I thought it might be my brother, but then remembered he had actually been at home when I left. I'm not sure what it was that made me get off of my bike and start yelling at the boys. I was used to defending my brother, a habit that I would carry with me into adulthood, but I didn't go looking for fights and certainly not with these guys. They didn't hear me at first, and as I walked toward them, it was like I could feel every punch and every kick they delivered to the boy on the ground, and my heart started to hammer in my chest. I took a deep breath and yelled for them to cut it out. Stop it, I said. The big boy was hunched over the kid, and when he heard me, he stood up tall. He gave me a snarly grin and then kicked the kid on the ground one more time in the stomach. It made me flinch and feel like I had just been kicked in the stomach myself. Who's going to make me? Their attention diverted to me, and I saw the kid on the ground roll onto his back and start to get up. It was a kid I kind of knew from school. I couldn't remember his name, but I knew his family had transferred here last year. His dad was at the air base. The kid's face was bloody. His glasses were in the dirt next to him. He had to be half the size of all three of us. I was as tall as these older kids, but they outweighed me by at least 30 pounds. I watched as he got to his feet and started staggering toward the church. I couldn't blame him for getting the hell out of there. You going to take his place? The two boys took a few steps toward me, and I felt my mouth go dry and my ears start to buzz. I tried taking some deep breaths the way Ruth had taught me, but I couldn't seem to get the air to fill up my lungs. This was not going to be good. So you think you're a hero, some kind of freaking hero. I didn't say anything. I tried relaxing my legs and my hands like I had learned in the magic shop. I bounced up and down on the balls of my feet and cleared out my thoughts. If I had to fight, I would. I wasn't going to run. I'm going to kick your ass and then we're going to take your bike. I still didn't say anything. I sensed the sidekick moving behind me a little, but I just stared straight at the guy. who liked to kick and to punch. He was one who called the shots for the pair. He moved his face so close to my face that I could see some sort of white gunk in the corner of his mouth. It was getting hotter by the second, and his face was sweaty and dirt stained. Unless you want to kiss my feet, he said. I thought of Ruth and Neil in the magic shop. They would be waiting for me to write up about now. Would Ruth think I had skipped a day with her when I didn't show up? Would anyone find me out here bleeding? Did the other kid go to get help? Did this guy wake up, have his cereal and milk, and just run out of the house ready to beat people up all without ever wiping his mouth? All of these thoughts started racing through my mind, but I just stared at the dry white gunk and pretended it was a light on a candle. Kiss my feet. I looked up and into his eyes and spoke for the first time since I had told him to stop beating the other kid. No. He reached out, grabbed the front of my t-shirt, kiss my feet, he threatened. His mouth began to make a smile like someone who knows he has power over another. 
His face got right up to mine, and I could smell and feel his breath. I closed my eyes for just a second, and in that second, something was different. I opened my eyes <clears throat> and looked directly into his. I stared deep into his eyes, the way we do when we're tr really trying to understand something or someone. You can do anything you want to me, but I'm not kissing your feet. He laughed and looked to the side at his friend. I saw him raise his eyebrows, and then he looked back at me. I stared at him without blinking. He lifted his fist and cocked it back behind his ear. I didn't flinch. I just kept my eyes locked on his. <clears throat> and in that moment, I didn't care that he was bigger than me or there was some other kid's blood on his fist. I wasn't going to back down. I wasn't going to give him <clears throat> the power to make me afraid. I wasn't going to kiss his feet or anyone's feet ever. And for a second, our eyes locked together, and I saw him. And he knew I saw him. I saw <coughs> his own pain. I saw his own fear. A pain and fear that he tried to hide with his bullying. His gaze broke from mine, and he looked at his sidekick and back at me. What a waste. He let go of my shirt and pushed me a little so that I stumbled back a step, but I didn't fall down. Then he looked at me again for the briefest of moments and turned away. It's too hot. Let's get out of here. I felt the other kid give a little push against my back, but it was more for show than anything else. I could tell he wasn't sure what had just happened. They both started walking away, and I could see the other boy talking to the bully. I knew he was asking why he didn't beat me up. The bully pushed him and said, shut up. Neither of them looked back. I took a few more deep breaths and watched them as they walked away before I turned toward my bike. I wasn't exactly sure what happened or even why I did what I did, but I felt good. Suddenly, I realized I was late and Ruth was waiting for me. I hoped she didn't think I had just broke, blown her off. I got on my bike and raced as fast as I could to the magic shop. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that with us. I, I want to start where you kind of um, took us, which is the magic shop. Uh, the, the title of the book, Into the Magic Shop. And when you were 12 years old, you walked into a magic shop to buy a novelty thumb, and you walked out many weeks later a very different person. And as you say, that changed the course of your life, the trajectory of your life. And you met this woman named Ruth. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about... That's not working either. Can you tell us a little bit about this experience in the magic shop? What happened over the six weeks? Who was Ruth? And how did that change the trajectory of your life? Sure. So um, you can imagine as a 12-year-old, as a 12-year-old, uh, I really wasn't particularly self-aware, but I was already suffering because in that sort of a dysfunctional, chaotic background where you don't know what's going to happen uh, from moment to moment, it's quite stressful. And also, you are angry because uh, you don't see yourself as having uh, any hope or being able to fill any of your own aspirations because you don't have access, you don't have money, you don't have mentors. And uh, so I was unhappy, and I was becoming a juvenile delinquent. And uh, so I was riding my bike uh, sort of a, a distance further than I normally go, and I saw this strip mall that had a magic shop. 
and I had an interest in magic, and I had, couldn't find my plastic thumb, which I did magic tricks with. And so I went into the store, and the owner was not there, but his mother was there. Now, his mother was just sitting in while he went on an errand, but she knew nothing about the magic in the store, but she knew a different type of magic. And I describe her as sort of this earth mother type. Do any of you guys have an idea of what I mean by that? She was sort of this big woman, and she was wearing a muumuu, and she had this wavy gray hair and these glasses that we have horrible sound here. Uh, she had this wavy uh, gray hair, and she had these glasses on a string that hung on her neck. But she had this, this incredibly radiant smile that was embracing. And as a 12-year-old, especially in my situation, adults really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to you. But she seemed to just be completely connected to me and asked me actually a number of questions, uh, and some of them fairly penetrating. And at the end of this uh, conversation, uh, which was about 20 or 30 minutes, she said, I'm here for another six weeks. If you show up, I'll teach you something that could change your life. And I wish I could tell you that I had some awareness of what was going on, but I didn't. The only thing I knew is she had given me some cookies, and she was nice, and frankly, I had nothing else to do. And fundamentally, that interaction with this woman did change the trajectory of my life. And what she did over this four-week period, and I describe this in the book, but it basically translated into four teachings, if you will, or four tricks. And it also gave me some insight into the mind. And the first thing she taught me was a meditation practice that allowed me to have attention and focus, but also to relax. And what I did not know at that time was that many of us are not relaxed. The manner in which we sit, how we position ourselves, actually oftentimes has to do with the stress and anxiety we have, which is manifesting itself in our muscles. And when you're tense or anxious, it doesn't allow you to focus. So she sent a, uh, did a period of time teaching me that. And then what she did was made me understand that, especially in the West, this is common, uh, is that all of us have a conversation going on in our head. And unfortunately for many people, it's not the one that says you're a great guy, is it? Right? It says you're not good enough, you're an imposter, you shouldn't be here, you're going to fail, don't do this. And we confuse that dialogue with us. And the reality is that dialogue has nothing to do with us. It's a created dialogue. But that dialogue, number one, uh, limits us because we believe it's us, and number two, the dialogue also results in us having a physiologic effect. And what she taught me was, first of all, to understand that reality, then to no longer have an emotional response, but to just be able to sit with that dialogue, but ultimately with practice to, if you will, turn the channel or turn the volume of that dialogue down and then to change the channel to a channel of self-affirmation. And no longer did I beat myself up, but I realized that, like all of us, first of all, we're frail, fragile human beings, but fundamentally, we're good. Fundamentally, we want to do the right thing. And fundamentally, we all have within us this incredible potential to make things manifest for us. And so she, in some ways, you know, I use the analogy, you can't be released from prison if you don't know you're in prison, right? That was a prison for me because I had been told that I was not going to amount to much. I had accepted what other people had created as a vision for me. And what happens for so many people is they allow that to define who they are. So that was an incredible gift that allowed me to see the world differently. The other thing she pointed out to me and that I embraced, although you'll see in the book I sort of forgot for a little while, was this idea that every one of us is suffering and that 
to really lead a meaningful life is to connect with others, to be of service to others, because that's when our physiology works its best. And this is, and we can talk about this a little later, but this is how we evolved as a species, to have theory of mind, to have abstract thinking, to have complex language. It requires that our offspring are cared for for a decade and a half or two, in my case, three. Uh, some of the USC students are probably the three decaders here, here uh, to your parents. Uh, that your, our offspring are cared for and the resources that are necessary, the energy, the time to care for our offspring is tremendous. And unless there is an inherent hard wiring that makes us want to care and nurture our young, our species would not survive. Plus, we have to have the ability to intuit when our offspring are suffering. And this is why we're able to process microfacial movements instantaneously to sense when someone is suffering, and also body language, and even smell. And when we care for another, it actually makes us feel better. And that is the reward we get, and it calms us down, and in fact, it makes our frontal executive control area work its best when we're in this relaxed position where we feel comfortable and are nurturing to others. So this is the other thing that she taught me. And this connecting to others is extraordinarily powerful. And then the last thing that she taught me was the power of intention and how to clarify your intention to achieve what you want. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that you say, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be Donald Trump. Well, actually, nobody would say that, would they? <laughs> I should say that. Uh, I'm sure he's a wonderful person. Uh, uh, Practicing compassion. Yes, I am. I am. It's not that you sit there and say, tomorrow I'm going to be X. You may have a goal to go from point A to point B, and by clarifying your intention, and I use the analogy that you may not have clarity and or sort of this window is cloudy, but if you use repetition and visualizing this, the, the window will start getting clear and allow you to see how to get somewhere. And it works on a subconscious level. And that was the last thing she taught me, and it became a very powerful tool for me. But what happened to me was that because of my circumstance, I thought that the most important thing that gave you happiness initially was control. Because growing up in my background, I had no control. And what do people think gives control? Money. Okay. So I ended up amassing a large amount of money. I used to have a Ferraris and Porsches and had a house overlooking the ocean, a villa in Florence, an island in New Zealand, and a few other things. Uh, and, uh, and I was a single guy. Uh, I got divorced. And, you know, I also, um, you, you become amazingly attractive when you have those things. It's, it's sort of a fascinating. Uh, uh, but what I realized was I was the most unhappy I had ever been when I had what I thought was everything because I forgot this most important part. And I had had this monkey on my back that was making me do these things I thought which would make me happy. And ultimately, I ended up losing everything. And uh, in the dot-com crash, where I was essentially bankrupt and had to get rid of everything, and I had made some commitments to charity and to live up to them, uh, I only had one asset left, and it was stock in a company that had yet to go public, of which I had been the CEO. And I voluntarily chose, to, when I was bankrupt, to give that away so I had nothing. Now, don't get me wrong, I was always a neurosurgeon, so I was not going to starve, so I don't want you to imply. In fact, Oprah called me. There's a story about this in the Wall Street Journal 
And Oprah called me and she said, oh God, this, your life must be ruined. It must be horrible. Are you living in the street? I said, look, <laughs> I'm a neurosurgeon. My worst day is I make more money than 99.9% of, .9 of the people, right? I said, frankly, my lifestyle didn't change that much. Oh, we're not interested in your story, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, because I wasn't living in the street. But so I don't want to imply that. The other thing I told her or her person was it would be insulting to complain about the situation, right? How could I possibly complain that, God, my life is ruined, I just lost $75 million, and my life sucks because I make more money than 99.9% .9 of people in the world? My life didn't suck. I had the greatest life in the world in that context. But giving that away ended up being the greatest decision I ever made. Because first of all, it released this monkey on my back where I didn't feel I had to strive anymore, but it also allowed me to create the center, which had been an interest of mine, to understand what are the drivers of making people compassionate or kind, and what's the value proposition. And it also allowed me to meet with some of the greatest spiritual leaders, including the Dalai Lama, uh, which has had a profound, profound positive impact on my life. In addition to the Dalai Lama, if you get buy the book, and I strongly recommend you do, uh, there are endorsements from Thich Nhat Hanh, from Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, from uh, Amma, uh, from uh, Solgo Rinpoche, and I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any of this stuff, right? So it's uh, it's an interesting phenomenon, right? Uh, so that's really uh, sort of the path and the trajectory. And we can talk some more. Thank you. Uh, when I was in, uh, a college age student, I lived for uh, a semester in a Buddhist monastery in India. And that's where I first encountered mindfulness practice. And I felt like it was really helpful in my life. But I also, you know, part of my goal in meditation was to levitate and walk through walls. Like I wanted to do all that stuff. Now we've rolled out Mindful USC. We've trained almost 2,000 people in the last two years on our campus in mindfulness practice. And it's a secular initiative that really focuses on wellness and learning outcomes. So learn to meditate for anxiety or for stress reduction or for insomnia, or learn to meditate to increase your focus or to be a creative thinker. That's kind of my pitch. If you were to tell people why they should take up a meditation or mindfulness practice, what would you say from the neuroscientific perspective? What's actually happening in one's brain when one meditates? And how does that relate to what you mentioned earlier, neuro neuroplasticity? So as I was talking about a little earlier, the evolution of our species, we are fundamentally hardwired to be kind and compassionate because when we're in that state, our physiology works its best. And to give you a really quick primer here, and we talk about, or I talk about the mind-heart connection, so we have this thing called the vagus nerve, which comes from our brainstem into our heart, but it also innervates other internal organs in our body. And it's a two-way conversation. It's not a one-way street. And as a species, we have two parts that are mediated through that pathway. One is the sympathetic nervous system, which is associated with our flight or fight response. And this is manifested in the amygdala and uh, in other parts of the brain, uh, which I won't bore you with right now. But uh, then the other is the parasympathetic nervous system, which gives us a sense of calmness, relaxing, and we feel like we want to have what we call affiliative behavior. And this is where oxytocin comes in, the love hormone, or the uh, nurturing care hormone. And what's amazing is that we find is that, first of all, remember, our DNA has not changed in the last 200,000 years. We are exactly as we were in the savanna in Africa. And our, that system worked really well there. If you saw the leaves or the grass move and you had experience that that represented a lion, your sympathetic nervous system would kick in. You would have the sudden release of these hormones. Your blood flow would be uh, diverted from your uh, internal organs to your skeletal muscle. Your heart rate would increase. Your pupils would dilate. Your sphincters would contract. Have any of you guys had that happen? Uh, and then you would run like hell. And if you survived, you survived. And if you didn't, it didn't really matter, right? Uh, but <clears throat> unfortunately, in modern society, the way we are wired that way often is not beneficial for many people. 
because we have constant distractions, whether it's our cell phones. Remember, as an example, a lion in Africa spends about 23 hours of its day just laying around. You know, we have increased with artificial lighting our day. We have all these things that are interfering with us. And we are constantly distracted, which engages our sympathetic nervous system and results in the chronic release of these hormones, which in a long-term, low-level release is very, very deleterious to our health. Can you imagine in the United States, and to show you the power of this connection, is that if you were to do a survey and ask people if they were in pain and suffering who they could turn to, one quarter of people would say nobody. Okay. Now we know if we look across the world that societies in which individuals live to be greater than 100, they can smoke and they can drink, but you know the thing that allows them to live to 100? It's because they have community. Multi-generational community where you have grown up there, you have died there, and what happens though is from the, your childhood to your death, everyone knows everything about you. And you know what? They still love you, okay? And that's really the key, because you're accepted, you're nurtured, even with all your flaws, people embrace you, they try to help you become a better person, everyone knows about you, cares about you, and that in and of itself is more beneficial to you, that type of connection, than exercise or being at your ideal body weight. Can you imagine? Who laughed? Um, the other interesting thing is that what we do know, though, is that with mental practices, as we were talking about here, is that you can actually have control over the tone of your vagus nerve. So with as little as two weeks of training, you can decrease your blood pressure, slow your heart rate down, boost your immune system, decrease these hormones that are associated with inflammation or stress, and then shift and increase the tone of your parasympathetic nervous system. And here's how powerful that type of uh, engagement is. There was a study that was done on women over the age of 65 who volunteered, as an example, and this isn't so much mindfulness, but it shows the power of connection, to volunteer to help other people. They were split into two groups, one who did and one who didn't. Women who did had almost a 2x increase in longevity compared to the group who didn't. That's how powerful human connection is. That's how powerful sort of shifting from the stress anxiety mode to this nurturing affiliative mode. And there were two exceptions in the self-report study. Do you know what they were? If the people were doing it so they would be rewarded or recognized, right? So it has to be authentic. Uh, one more question, then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, you are a secular humanist, which means you do not see the world through the prism of uh, theism, supernatural theism. But at the same time, you hang out with all of the great religious leaders of the world. He's flying on Wednesday out to the Vatican to meet with the Pope. Um, you are the co-chair of the Parliament of the World Religions. You're on the board of the first interfaith university in the United States. Uh, you are a founder uh, and leader of the Charter for Compassion, which is a group of religious leaders who have sort of enacted that. So as a secular humanist, why do you find it important to engage in an interfaith capacity with religious practitioners? And what do you think the value of religion is that you keep coming back for one reason or another. And I say this with secular student leaders in the audience and interfaith student leaders in the audience as well. I really don't like those people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, it, it is an interesting question. And first of all, here's what I would tell you. Uh, if you talk to any evolved spiritual leader, they are not lost in their dogma they really recognize that this is a, sort of a way to explain the world, but it may not necessarily be reality, okay? And they can tell if a person is not authentic in a heartbeat. 
what good is it to know every bit of the dogma of a religion if you're not a nice person or you're a hater, right? I mean, I would rather hang out with a nice atheist than a hating Christian or a Muslim, right? <laughs> and these people feel the same way. The reason I am able to be embraced by these individuals, and I really do have relationships with all of these people, is because, and I've never talked about the dogma with a single one of these people, ever. It's, it's, so, it's completely uninteresting to me. I talk about love, I talk about kindness, I talk about compassion, because fundamentally that's what's going to save all of us and that's what's going to change the world. These people aren't interested in me quoting the Heart Sutra to them. <laughs> they know it, uh, right? Uh, and I don't have to sit with them to go over that. And the thing is, they see people all the time strive to spout off this stuff, but they don't really care. They don't get it. It's not about the tenant of the religion, per se. It's about love, compassion, connection, and caring. And if you come to them with that, authentically, I will tell you, they will love and embrace you. And that's, you know, have, do any of you guys know Hunter S. Thompson? You know, he said something. Um, he said, I don't advocate the use of drugs and alcohol for everyone, but it works for me. Um, I don't advocate the use of love and kindness and compassion, <laughs> but it works for me. And so uh, that's what allows me to uh, really have these wonderful uh, interactions. And I tell you, those interactions have been the most meaningful because it's not about the dogma per se, it's about really loving and caring and connecting with people. Thank you, thank you. So let's open it up for Q&A. Um, please, if you have a question, um, I ask that you um, to speak a little loudly so we can get it on the camera and that you also introduce yourself. And we'll start with the... Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Mariano, I'm from uh, the behavioral limitation class. When you looked at the bully, uh, you said you were looking at his eyes and you said he, you saw his, uh, who he was deep inside. And you talk about the magic uh, shop. How were you able to see inside this person's, uh, I don't know, I, I guess we would call it his soul? What happens to many people is that because we're not in the system I described where you live with those who know you and care about you, we live in a modern world where oftentimes the people you interact with you've just met or have not known for very long. So what do you do when you interact with those people? You're not your authentic self most of the time, are you? You are a projection of who you want people to think you are, right? The problem is that that projection is not you. And until you can be vulnerable and show who you really are and show that you're a frail, fragile ho human being who is suffering, you cannot truly connect with another person because they have their own projection that they're shooting at you. And the interesting thing is that when you're with one of these spiritual leaders, what happens is you don't need any projection. And you don't appreciate the amount of psychic energy it takes to maintain this projection. And when you're with one of these people, like the Dalai Lama, people say, what's it like to be with the Dalai Lama? You are absolutely embraced, surrounded by love. You don't have any projection. And this is the same thing I was talking about living in a place where you know everyone and everyone loves you even for who you really are, believe it or not. And so when you talk about this bully, he has a projection that he wants to promote, yet what is this bully? He's actually a terrified little boy who's in pain. And when my eyes connected with him, and he knew that I saw that, he was no longer the projection. He was the frightened little boy. And he knew he couldn't do what he was doing because I knew. Yes, in the very back. I'm a little bit sick, so I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Boris. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for coming down and spending time to come here and speak with us. Uh, I'd like to preface this, 
question with that uh, there's no uh, no means intent to offend anybody who is religious here. I am a fellow atheist, secular. Get it out of here. No. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe in the values of research and intellectual discussion on campus. So I would just like to draw attention to your last point uh, about interacting with these religious leaders. I think that uh, on your comparison, I would say I would rather hang out with a nice atheist over a nice Muslim. Of course, I would rather hang out with somebody nice over, not Muslim, but a religious person, a Christian person. I think that when you say dogma is irrelevant, I would, I would disagree with that because while they might individually on a personal level be very nice people and genuinely so, I don't think, I know from experience, there are definitely secular people out there who also strive to dedicate their lives to niceness. These people are nice people while being the figurehead of a major tenet of religion that, for example, like the Pope, the Catholic figurehead, he is a head of a religion that is so, you know, tied in scandals and all these rumors of very not compassionate and nice things. How, how do you reconcile this while you're attracting them as a, on an individual level? Because I would think that one does matter in this context. Well, I, l listen, I appreciate what you're saying, but it's like, are you an American? No, no, sir. Okay. <laughs> what are you? Huh? What are you? Oh, that's a long story, sir. I'm a Make up something. I, uh, I was born in Australia, grew up a lot of places, including uh, in Europe and China, where I graduated high school from in Shanghai most recently. So I'd say I'm from Shanghai, China. Okay. Well, let's, then we'll talk about China for a second. So, so are you Chinese, then citizen of China? Sorry? Are you a citizen of China? No, I'm a citizen of Australia. That's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm in Australia, okay? My point is, though, that whether it's America, which I'm an American citizen, whether you're Chinese, frankly, there's a fantasy that is created here, right? You know, we live by these theoretically democratic ideals, but we condone torture. We have relationships with Saudi Arabia, one of the most repressive regimes in the world, yet we talk about American ideals. We have vast wealth inequality such that the idea of the American dream is fundamentally impossible for somebody from poverty or who's a minority to attain it. We have China, which is one of the most ruthless economic countries in the world and is a godless country, but they're going to pick the next pope. I mean, this is all surreal, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not real. The thing, though, is that, look, I absolutely appreciate what you're saying. If every religious person went by the absolute tenets of their religion, frankly, they would be completely confused because they contradict each other all over the place. Which do you choose? Uh, and what most people choose, frankly, is what works for them to function in civil society. Because, and Sam Harris says this, if you were truly either a Muslim or a Christian, you would do some of the most horrible things based on your religion, but you can't possibly do that because you couldn't function. So what most religious people do is they choose a set of things that sort of go along with how they see the world, and that's what they do. Look, 70-some percent of the world has some sort of religious belief. If I said, I'm not going to hang out with 75% of the world, I'm going to be pretty lonely. And frankly, most of these religious people who say they're religious are not that religious. And in fact, have, have any of you ever seen this movie? It was called The God Who Wasn't There. It's a great DVD. It's about this Christian evangelical who grew up. And he started questioning his background. And then he did a survey. So he went to this place, uh, the survey of people who had just left a revival thing. I think it was Oral Roberts or one of those types of people. And there were 10 questions he asked of this group of people who were leaving. Now, you would think that these people who are coming out of this thing who tell you they're incredibly religious would be able to answer 10 questions that are fundamental questions of their religion. The average answer was less than 4 out of 10, right? Most people don't understand their religion. They understand just enough to get along the way they see the world and get along. It's like the problem we have is confirmational bias, where we create a belief system that works for us, and we only listen to the stuff that supports our belief system. So uh, I appreciate what you're saying, and you're right. But 
I would choose to be with anyone who's kind. I don't care what religion they are, or their sex, or their creed, or their ethnicity. If you're a nice person, hey, I'm all for you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, guys. I'm Katie. Um, I'm part of the Secular Student Fellowship that Dean Tony mentioned a little earlier. And we talk a lot about the power of compassion and like ways we can use that in things. Um, but sometimes I meet people that test my ability to have compassion. And I guess my question, I <laughs> and I guess my question to you is, whenever you meet someone that maybe you find on every other level um, frustrating or whatever, like how do you exercise compassion for those individuals? Well, look, I mean, there's a subset of people who you just cannot get along with. I mean, no matter how much you try, and I would say you just don't interact anymore because there is a subset of people who are like that. No matter how much you try, it's going to be frustrating. But I'll tell you an example, <clears throat> and this was a story that was told to me. There was a, a student, and she had a, a, a dorm mate, and there was a very unhappy person, and she wasn't in her room, but she'd walk out every day, and this person would have this horrible sort of frown on their face. And every day she would greet her and say, good morning, I, I hope you have a great day. And the person would never respond. This went on for three months. And finally, one time she went up to her and said this, the woman just completely broke down. And she said, thank you so much for being so persistent, because I don't know how to interact with people. Okay? And this ultimately led to a, a dialogue where they became friends. So again, you know, Viktor Frankl said between uh, stimulus and response, there's a pause. And what happens to many of us that when we are stimulated in a negative way by somebody who has a negative energy, if you will, and I don't want to be new agey with you, but I think you understand what I mean. You know, what's our natural tendency to do? It's to put up our defenses and get into this attack mode. But if you pause and process this and have no response, because a lot of people, when they're having this interaction with you, it's not even about you. Something has gone on bad in their life that day that actually is affecting how they're even functioning. And oftentimes, their interaction with you isn't about you. And if you don't have a reaction that they expect, which justifies their behavior, it oftentimes allows the situation to de-escalate. And if in every one of the interactions you have with somebody who often is a negative person, you're kind and compassionate, what are you going to do? Are they going to smack you around and say, don't be kind or compassionate to me? I mean, in general, and this is what changed my life. Because I was this angry youth who was becoming a juvenile delinquent who didn't have any, who just had despair. And my circumstance did not change in the interaction with Ruth. What changed was my reaction to the world, which was no longer with reactivity, it was no longer with anger, it was with acceptance, it was not having an emotional response, and it was looking at everyone as having their own issues, and that everyone was worth loving. And when I changed my response to the world, the world changed its response to me, and people became my advocates and helpers and not people who were fighting against me because I was confrontive. And it allowed me to do my deal. Yes, sir. Um, one of the quotes I find like, very striking to me is, like, the world is too exhausted for compassion. And then specifically, <coughs> America is too exhausted for compassion. So when you allude to, like, um, <coughs> kind of more like villages in the east that have like a much slower pace of life and they're able to you know practice their mindfulness more as a way of like part of their lifestyle and then you talk more about america where the sleep cycle is deteriorating and people are sleeping less and less you have the synthetic lighting and you have just the you know crazy workforce where people are just working their asses off um what is kind of like your vision of how to like install these like different ways of like compassion and all that kind of stuff when people are just so exhausted in their everyday lives even to be open-minded to that to change their lifestyle you know it's funny somebody sent me a thing that said and it was describing a person he lives two hours from his work so he can afford a house so he drives two hours in he works 10 hours of work to drive two hours back to spend the money on the car and the insurance to buy 
the house, which he only goes to sleep in, and what kind of a life is that, right? And the question I think you have to ask yourself, and this is a problem of the West, is what is it that you are striving for? What do you get at the end of the day by killing yourself? Because, as I described to you, and I know many people who have nominally everything that says you are a success in society, right? They have the big house, they have a high income, and they're miserable people who've had multiple divorces, their children hate them, uh, and they go home every night alone, and the only thing that, and a, a lot of people get lost in this, is because they have all these people who think they have a great life, and go, God, you're a great guy, and that's where the only place they get any sort of positive support, when in fact they have a horrible life. The question is, what is your life? And you know, it's interesting because uh, Rune and I were talking earlier, and I said I just gave a talk, and the way the talk began was, I've spent the last quarter of a century as a physician and a neurosurgeon preventing death, but the, some of the most meaningful experiences I've had as a human being is being with people who have truly lived who are dying. I spent the last decade of my life as a neuroscientist understanding what stops people from truly living. And what is truly living? It's not chasing after these things that offer you no sustenance in what you need to be a nurtured human being. What gives, what all of us at the end of our days want is what I call transcendence. That is to know that you have meant something here, that your life has had some meaning, and that after you pass, people will remember you as having given meaning to their lives. That is what all of us wish for. And that is not a journey alone. It's not a journey by yourself. It's a journey of connection to others. And you know, having a, being a billionaire and having all of this money at the end of the day and flying around in private jets, if you're lonely and unhappy and haven't helped a single person, that's not a meaningful life. It's a horrible life. Having a okay income, yet you do something that you're passionate about and that you care about and that you're positively affecting people where people love you. They love to see you. They love to interact with you. They want to be around you and you can teach people and mentor people, that's what will give you health and wellness, and it's what will give you a meaningful life. Yes, sir. I hope you're not another atheist. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes, you back there. Yes, you. Uh, my name's Ian Anderson. I'm also with uh, Professor Matoli's Human Behavior and Public Communications class. Uh, you had mentioned intergenerational communities as being fundamental to maintaining not only emotional but also kind of physical mm -hmm. wellness. I'm wondering if that's possible through telecommunications. So we, we, uh, we, we exist in a world, in a global world, and it's not always possible to live and, and be physically in the same community throughout your life through multiple generations. Can you access that, that sense of community and can it, and is it as valid through Skype, or through you know the phone, through, through calling someone, through, uh, through telecommunication. Well, I was just on a panel where we were judging uh, actually contestants who were. It was from the Center for Longevity at Stanford, but people were creating apps to promote longevity, and one of them was something exactly like that, where it was sort of a skyping app that allowed you to connect with grandparents and children and you would have sort of this virtual connection to people all the time. And I think that that is possible, but I'll tell you about a study, then it was measuring levels of oxytocin, and it was teenager girls who were put through stress, and then there, were, there was one interaction where they could telephone, or they could see their mother and exchange their angst about this to, uh, uh, anxiety that was, was artificially created. There was one where they could um, talk on the phone, and then there was one where they texted. And uh, uh, so if they actually saw their parent, they had these release of oxytocin, 
and this sort of sense of nurturing and caring. If they talked on the phone, it wasn't as high, but it was there. If they texted, it wasn't there. So the other interesting thing is that is part of our evolutionary baggage is this concept of tribalism, which in some ways gets to this religiosity and other things that allow people to get separated from others. There is a tendency for people to hang around with those who look like them, act like them, same socioeconomic class, same culture, same religion, same color, whatever it is. And it gives them a sense of safety and trust, and it kicks in sort of this parasympathetic nervous system component of nurturing, but it can also be very negative because, again, when we were hunter-gatherers, which was our primary survival strategy in groups of 10 to 50 till six to 8,000 years ago, it was wonderful because you're in a very harsh environment and being able to recognize the suffering or pain of somebody in your group and attending to that was great and you had to stick together or you put the group at risk. But in the modern world, it can be manipulated, as you see, uh, to create separation. And what we all have to strive to do is to overcome, if you will, our evolutionary baggage and get back to that fundamental component, which is the nurturing and caring component, which are really is our default mode and really is our greatest part of us, the most human part of us, and try to overcome this evolutionary baggage of the stress response, which has great negativity and great negative health consequences, to mitigate it and also to deal with this issue of tribalism and understand that the world is our home and that everyone is our sister, brother, mother, father. It's not just those surrounding us. And you can overcome that. We know that if you look at another person who's far different from you and if you can pick out some things that you can find in common, it immediately starts bringing you together instead of separating you. Like if you're one religion and you see another religion you may not like, but if you think of that person and you say, geez, they have children like I do, they want the best for their children, look at them play with their children, really, they're just like me. Then that starts decreasing the, these barriers of separation. And that's what's gonna allow our species to survive. The other is to have an understanding of this concept of confirmational bias where we have a tendency, regardless of what the truth is, to selectively pick data points that support a predetermined outcome and to be more self-aware about this and try to be more open about this. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, and actually I tell some neurosurgery stories. In fact, the book starts out actually with quite a moving neurosurgery story, does it? <laughs> the sound of the, the skull being, uh, the, the the scalp being scalp ripped, being from, ripped the, from the head. Yeah, yeah so, uh, uh, but look, uh, to do what I do, you have to absolutely objectify the person, right? Because it's a technical exercise. And in fact, I give an example in the book of an opera singer I, I operated on who she had a, an, an aneurysm that needed to be clipped by her speech area. And I had, be, in the process of deciding to do her surgery and going through the evaluation and everything, I actually became friends with her. And so as I'm operating on her, and I see this aneurysm which is pulsating with blood, and I'm about to put a clip on, and if I make a mistake or it ruptures, she could potentially be devastated, I thought about her humanity. And my hand started shaking. And I had to sit down to get back in this mode of objectifying this into a technical exercise. That being said, uh, I try to be a very caring and compassionate person with my patients. You know, I lean into them, I touch them, I make them feel as though hopefully they're the most important person I'm talking to instead of saying, you know, I have another patient. Have you ever been to a party where somebody looks at you and they're looking over your shoulder to see who's more important or more attractive than you are? Uh, but anyway. Like every party I go to. <laughs> <laughs> every interaction I have for some reason. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I can still hold 
patients or, you know, what I tell our residents is, look, for me, this is routine, right? This is just everyday life. My interaction, though, with that patient and family, that may be the most important singular event that may happen to them in their entire lives, and I have to honor that and respect that and acknowledge that. And I have no problem crying with my patients. I have no problem hugging them. I have no problem being with them. And I will also tell you, in the operating room, you know, things don't always go perfect. But if I have done my job correctly, anything that happens, I'm ready to, to deal with so my heart rate never increases, but I also never raise my voice, except in very, very rare circumstances, because until proven otherwise, everything is my fault. If you function like until proven otherwise, everything is your fault, you rarely scream at anybody, right? Because the way I look at it, if I have done my preparation correctly in terms of evaluating the situation, evaluating the patient, bringing my team together, picking the right equipment, if something happens, it is my mistake. And by doing that, I don't raise my voice, I don't throw things, I seldom get flustered, I just take some time. So, so uh, but I, I care about my patients, and that's why I said earlier, what happens also in modern medicine is, what have we done in modern medicine? We have created a model of, of illness, not wellness, right? It's very expensive. The other is that we have separated life from death. Death is a part of life. And for many neurosurgeons and physicians, as soon as they see a patient who's terminally ill, they are gone. Because what is that in their mind? It's failure. And nobody wants to be slapped with failure. For me, I honor that because spending time with people who are passing, who have really lived their lives, is one of the most incredible gifts you can be given to see how they handle it, to see what they say, to see what they're thinking about, to talk with them, to share with them. It's an incredible experience and privilege to be with that. So uh, it's, it's sad, though, that that's the way our healthcare system is. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, or ma'am, I'm sorry. Uh, I was wondering, you had mentioned earlier about compassion and the potential to overcome tribalism. And I'm wondering to what extent you think it's your ability or responsibility as a representative of this field to use care, kindness, and compassion to address racial justice, social justice, economic justice, and whether that's possible. I don't think there's any relationship. Waste of time. Uh, no, of course, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. Uh, in fact, in the book, uh, you know, I had the honor of. Um, uh, how much time do we have? Can I talk for? Okay, uh, but yes, uh, in the book I talk about, I gave a talk at uh, something called the White Coat Ceremony for medical students, and they were about to start medical school, and I wanted to give them something that they could carry with them as a practice, and what I said was it was a way to live with intention, and it was a distillation of really what I had learned. And um, so it's, you know, in medical school, you have to learn mnemonics, right, to remember things. So I said there are 10 let letters of the alphabet that keep me centered, and it's actually my practice, and it's C through L. And it is our responsibility. So, but what I do with intention every day as I go through this multiple times, which is C is compassion for self and others. D is recognizing the dignity of every person. E is practicing equanimity, F is practicing forgiveness, G is having gratitude, H, which is the hardest for a neurosurgeon, is humility, I is having a set of values and integrity that you live by, J is social justice, so your responsibility to care for those who are most vulnerable, K is kindness, the active component of compassion, all contained by love. And we do have a responsibility. It's all of our responsibility. And what people sometimes forget is that they'll sit there and say, geez, and I think you were alluding to this, you know, there's so much suffering. What can I do? I'm only one person. One person can have a profound, profound impact. It doesn't matter whether you're wealthy, poor, what religion you are. Every interaction with another human being is the opportunity to make their life better. This woman, Ruth, had no reason to be nice to me, right? But she changed the trajectory of my life 
by that taking the extra effort to just do something that she didn't have to do. And it changed everything. Each of us has the ability to do that. I'll give you a really quick example. I, there's a, a coffee shop I go to frequently, and one day I took my 10-year-old son. And there was a woman there who I see every day, and I always say hello to him. We chat a little bit. And she was talking to my son, and she said, you know, I have a 9-year-old daughter. And this woman's in her maybe 30s, early 30s. And I said, really? And we started talking about this. And it turns out she got pregnant in college. She kept the child, dropped out of college. Her dream was to become a doctor. And because of this, she wasn't able to become a doctor. But now she was now inspired again to do this. And she'd been trying to get into med school for some time unsuccessfully. So it took me a little bit of time. But I said, look, why don't you let me help you and look at your stuff? I went over her stuff, helped her reorganize it, wrote a letter for her, and she's now a doctor. It took three or four hours of my time. But it changed the trajectory of her life. Each of us has the ability by simply sometimes even saying hello to somebody to change the trajectory of somebody's life. And that is your gift. It doesn't have to be a million people or a thousand people. It's one person. And if each of us puts into this ocean a drop of compassion, it will ripple through and hopefully turn into a tsunami that will cover the world. We have time for one more question. I want to give uh, the opportunity to the gentleman here who actually read the book. So um, <laughs> uh, let's do this one. I'm surprised that a lot of other people didn't read the book because it was really that good. Um, so I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ali. Um, and uh, the question that I had for you is kind of on top of what the gentleman in the front was talking about with respect to behavior. Um, I'm a recent graduate of family medicine uh, and I'm a physician and when I read your book I found a tremendous number of, of similarities in terms of the obstacles uh, that you went through trying to get to medical school and obtain a residency especially in neurosurgery which is very very difficult. Um, and one of the things that I, I found really touching in your book was your description of a young African-American boy in New Orleans uh, that didn't get uh, caught in terms of getting the proper antibiotic treatment which led to I believe an abscess in his, his brain and led to his death and um, as a physician I've seen too much of that um, and it, it really hurts uh, and I, I became very disillusioned as a physician going through the process um, my view of the healthcare system today in America is is one of a system that's very very poor and it lacks a lot of the things that you have been talking about in your in your book that I think are, are truly important um, going back to what this gentleman said it, how do you how do you move towards changing behavior of a society such as ours that is so so uh, trapped and trapped by the society that we've created for ourselves this the artificial stimulus that we talk about telephone uh, cell phones computers so on and so forth how do we get away from that, disengage ourselves from that, such that we can really do, and, and I guess this is kind of even going back to, your, to the center that you've created, and, and uh, I really appreciate that, that you've done that. That's, that's a tremendous thing that you've done. Um, how, do you, how do you create and instill that atmosphere such that we're shifting the, the uh, mentality of humanity as it is right now? Because <coughs> lastly, I wanted to say that you said something that was very important. Um, that compassion and love will be our saving grace as humanity, and I, I really truly believe that at the end of the day. How do you get people to buy into that? Well, look, I mean, I have to say, we don't see all the billionaires sitting in this room thanking Jim Doty for his book, do you, right? Because these are people who fundamentally don't need anybody else, right? And unfortunately, what happens to many people is that the more they get, the more they want, because they're in this artificial, because they're so empty and hungry, they think that the, it becomes this game to get more and more, and that's the scorecard that somehow makes them important. And you know, the Donald Trumps of the world, <coughs> who are so empty and so insecure, they think that, and unfortunately, there's a subset of people who sit and go, God, Donald, you're so great, you got all this money, and that's what they live on because everything else is emptiness. Uh, and uh, again, it gets back to what I said. Each of us is a human being. We have certain abilities. 
and we can only do what we can do. The problem is you can't get so lost. This is what happens with burnout and, and compassion fatigue, is you don't set boundaries for yourself and you get so discouraged about this endless wave of suffering that you can't do anything about. But again, we can do a thing within the boundaries of our own environment. And if we all do that and try the best we can, that's all we can hope for. Yeah, you know, that child dying was absolutely horrible. And this was a description I gave of a child who had no health insurance and had been going to some nurse who kept giving him the wrong antibiotics and he got a brain abscess and his parents brought him in and he, he uh, essentially was comatose and I tried to save his life and he died. Right? And the sad thing was that you know, these poor people have been so beaten down <clears throat> by the world that, you know, they just accepted it and then they thanked me, right? But this child should never have been in that position, right? Where he didn't have access to health care. And this is a sad thing, you know, people somehow, you hear a certain subset of people going, boy, we have the health, greatest health care in the world in the United States. We don't have the greatest health care in the world. We have the worst health care of any industrialized country in the world with we measure in the lowest quadrants of all measures of health care. We have the most expensive health care. We have the most dissatisfied group of people in regard to that health care. And it is a travesty to have the highest infant mortality rate of all industrialized country and the highest level of childhood poverty. But if each of us commits ourselves, to, again, to try to help one person, that's all you have to do, to volunteer, to embrace another person, that starts changing everything. That changes the world. And when people see people doing these types of things, it motivates them to be kind. And that's really, really the key at the end of the day. So I hope all of you have found this conversation as enlightening as I have. Please join me in thanking our very special guest, Dr. James Doty. <laughs> I know he'll stick around to talk with everyone. We'll set up, um, the, the books are available for sale right outside here. We'll set up a table probably in here where he can meet and sign and greet. Um, we do have a reception with punch and cookies, so please stick around, be in community with each other, uh, get to know one another, buy a book, meet Jim, and um, fight on. Thank you, everyone.